Let us hear then the written word from the Old Testament, starting in Exodus 19.5. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Exodus 28, 36. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to Yahweh. Leviticus 21, 10 through 15. The priest who is chief among his brothers on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. He shall not go into any dead bodies, nor make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother. He shall not go out of the sanctuary, lest he profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on him. I am the Lord. And he shall take a wife in her virginity. A widow, or a divorced woman, or a woman who has been defiled, or a prostitute, these he shall not marry. But he shall take as his wife a virgin from his own people, that he may not profane his offspring among his people, for I am the Lord who sanctifies him. From the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, for if someone does not know how to maintain, or to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, nor addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 5.17 Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light. So far, God's word. We pray, O oh Lord, for your spirit to help us to understand and what, to know what it means to be members of the church, to be a people who are to be salt and light, but who also have this high calling that the world cannot see or understand, that we are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Let us also appreciate that we are to live in an ordered manner in the body of Christ and to have respect for each office and desire that all men should do their work nobly and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the Christian church is supposed to be founded on Christ the cornerstone and the apostles as the foundation and then built up as living stones into a living temple where the Spirit of God dwells. It is a royal priesthood and a holy nation that is light to the nations, bringing the blessings of the gospel to all the world. The unfortunate nature of man, however, is to corrupt everything good, to never be satisfied with what God has given. And so unfortunately, the Roman church in Western Europe essentially became a very prideful institution, starting very nobly, very humbly from a crucified savior 
and then being a people who were mostly slaves and lower class, over time, people with means, people with money, became members of the church. The church became dignified, and it started attracting people who were willing to be identified with it out of social desire rather than firm conviction, I was dead and now I am alive in Christ. Over time, many noble people seeing the work of the church would leave great inheritances to the church to the point that by the end of the Middle Ages, the church owned about a third of the land in Europe when land really defined wealth because it was the yearly production of agriculture that sustained a nation. The church was wealthy beyond measure. And of course, wherever you have wealth or power, you attract the kind of people that like wealth or power. And so the church had become horribly corrupt. And while it was out of a noble and loving desire, people had given these things to the church. Unfortunately, it was not used in a loving way, but rather, as I said, it became the treasured possession of this institution. And it attracted the people who loved having that power. And so the church became more progressively corrupt over time. In the midst of this, of course, God kept on raising up faithful men and women. He kept pouring out his spirit. Many were still hearing the gospel and being saved, however corrupted the gospel was. And among those who were called to priesthood, there were also those who studied the word and took seriously what God said, and the spirit moved in them. And so throughout the Middle Ages, there were numerous attempts at reform in the Western church, but they were ultimately crushed quite often. However, God gave his grace to the world and he intended for his gospel to be heard. And eventually he raised up the men at the right time for the Reformation. And the Reformation occurred and now the Western church began losing power. But in the midst of this, the reformers, they did not come out and say, we're here to destroy the old church. Rather, we want to reform Christ's body, the church. We want to see the gospel preached. We would love all the priests who currently serve in office to have their office if they would repent of heresy, if they would no longer be lovers of money, but instead would love to see the gospel proclaimed. And so it's very important. The reformers were trying to reform the church, not to destroy it, not to create something new, but they understood the church was not the institution, was not the buildings, was not the bank accounts, the church is where the gospel is preached and where the people of God are gathered together. So in light of this, in the midst of the Reformation, of course, the Roman church and, of course, the magistrates often opposed the reformers. They were not interested in the faithful preaching of the gospel. In fact, many kings understood that the structure of the church with a hierarchy and the pope at the head gave a model to the people of how their nation should be with the king as the head of the nation. And so they were terrified of the idea that ordinary people would be involved in the management of the affairs of the church with elders taken from the laity, because that would mean that the king also would now need to submit to a council of ordinary people called up to be his advisors, and you would no longer have a monarchy, but you might have a republic. And so there was a great deal of opposition against the Reformation. In light of this, however, the reformers continued to persevere in love. And the Belgic Confession is written to the monarch, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was a Spaniard at that time, but he also ruled over lands in uh, what today would be the Netherlands and Belgium. And they said, we are not in any way interested in dethroning you. Our interest is not in earthly affairs, but only that Christ be rightly worshipped and glorified and recognized as head and king of the church. And therefore here, let us show you from the word God has given, and which is undeniable, even in Rome, that the scriptures are the word of God. The problem with Rome is they also add to the word. And they said, look, from the word of God, we show you, we believe what God has said. We are interested in simply hearing this gospel proclaimed. We understand we are called to submit to those in lawful authority, and we will, but we need the church of Jesus Christ reformed. So the Belgic Confession then lays out our faith, telling us, so it's a service to us, but also proclaiming to the world, this is who we are, this is what we believe, it's not some abstract concept. So that's why we've been looking at the Belgic Confession of Faith, as it is 
the foundation of our church's theology. So last week we were looking at what the officers are, that there is in the church ministers, elders, and deacons. However, we also clarified the office of lay member. These are all honorable and dignified offices. And the unfortunate thing is our human nature is we think that if anybody has any authority or power that somehow that degrades or demeans us. But that is not true. Rather, authority and power is often given by God so that there can be order in society. It is not about ruling over others, but ruling well so that all would benefit. And so the lay members are not lesser in the church as Christ's blood equally saves us. And we are all called to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And that's where we will begin first today. Looking at Exodus 19 compared to 1 Peter 2, 9, you see that the God says, you are my treasured possession and you are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And the apostle Peter writing to the church says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood and a holy nation a people for his own possession, so that you may have this great and wonderful duty, proclaiming the excellencies of God and Jesus, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this is the idea of the priesthood of all believers. Each and every one of us has a great, high, dignified office, and we owe service to God. However, in the church, there has to be decisions made. There has to be order, and everybody all the time being able to give their opinions does not promote order. And so for that reason, there is officers in the church not to rule over you, but in order to govern and keep the church healthy so that all of us may be trained up in truth, encouraged to righteousness, and be able to declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now in the Old Testament, you see the imagery of the office bearers, especially as they point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. The high priest is marked out separate and he wears a plate of pure gold. So not gold plated as many other things are in the Old Testament, but it is solid gold, which has the declaration on it, holy to Yahweh, indicating service. And this high priest is not better than the rest of the Israelites. Going back to Exodus 19, all of you are my treasured possessions. All of you are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But a sacrifice needs to be offered each year on the Day of Atonement. Everybody cannot come up and do that. And so I appoint for you a representative, this high priest. Now some would say, well, why does he get the honor? And of course, that's what Korah's rebellion was all about, was Korah, Dathan, and others rising up and saying, why does Moses and Aaron get to do everything? Aren't we also, according to Exodus 19, a treasured possession and holy? And God says, you are, but I've also given you a station. And understand that as high priest, people only see the high priest having these robes and the ceremony to appoint him and the golden plate. But look at in Leviticus 21, the cost to his life. He has to die to self. He is not allowed to have an ordinary life anymore. He is not free to mourn the death of his own parents. In a close-knit society where there was an obligation and an expectation that you would mourn and grieve when you know, a loved one died, especially a father, the high priest must be completely indifferent. His service to God is such he is not allowed to grieve the death even of his mother or his father. And he therefore, to the world, would seem cold-hearted, but this is his duty. And in a society where everybody else gets to, he is not allowed to express even his own emotion because he's been called to this service. And then when it goes on to explain the wife he is to take... He is essentially being restricted more and more. So even growing up as a young man, he had attraction to someone else. If she was not a wife in her virginity or she had been married before, divorced or from a different tribe, whatever, he could not have her. So already he's got even more and more restrictions on him. All this because he serves in the temple of God. So you see that being an officer, yes, it in the world is recognized, but it is a costly service that he has. Continuing on to the New Testament, 
we see as Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him how to uh, administer the church where he is serving as a pastor. He says that we are to have overseers, elders, and deacons. And ideally, every Christian should meet this criteria, but obviously everyone does not. But we are told that for those who serve, they are to be seen by others and recognized by others as you know, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, not lovers of money, who have shown the ability to manage their households well, having dignity, not forcibly making their children conform, but with a dignified and respectable way, having their wives and children it, it, in loving submission and order. And he must not be a recent convert. He must be well thought of by outsiders. And continuing on with the deacons, also dignified, not double tongued, not greedy. Uh, they must also, with a clear conscience, believe the, the truths of the scriptures and be tested first before they serve. And their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, sober minded, faithful in all things. You see then that. The officers are indeed members of the church, but they are also to be those who over time have been tested, known to have a faith that truly rests in Christ Jesus so that they hold their faith without uh, any doubt, with a clear conscience. They have shown this love in such a way that those who know them the best, wives and children, respectfully submit to them and keep an ordered house, and they then manage the church for the glory of God. So that, as Peter says, you as a chosen race and a royal priesthood are able to proclaim the excellencies of God's grace. And for this reason, elders who rule well should be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So it's, again, not about the value of the man, but about the service that they are providing for the community. And as we'll see in the summary in Article 31, there's a reason for this call to double honor. Number one, we rarely give proper honor to anybody. Our human tendency is to find fault. And you see this anywhere. People that you've never thought of before, who you're perfectly content being friends with or whatever else. But if they get recognized or promoted above you in some way, all of a sudden, your mind goes through all your history with them and you pick out a hundred defects that before meant nothing. But the moment that they are elevated or somebody else recognizes them, all of a sudden you see, boy, why? Why? Because you're selfish. Why not me? Why am I not the one receiving it? So this call for double honor is not talking about you being subservient and servile and glorifying such people. It's just reminding you that you actually do need to recognize this is a difficult task. It is necessary to corral you know, all sorts of people. And again, the church is not bringing in just one type of people, but people from every tribe and tongue and nation, from every social group, and trying to make us all as one body, lovingly serving one another. So in that light, you see now how the Article 31 summarizes the calling of ministers of the church and officers. So number one, we believe that ministers of God's words, the elders and the deacons, so all three offices, they should be chosen to their respective offices by the lawful election by the church with calling upon the name of the Lord and in that order which the word of God teaches. So first of all, remember, this is being written at the end of the Middle Ages in the Reformation where <coughs> church officers were quite often people whose families had bought an office for them. After all, remember, the church has the money and the power and quite often, if you got even a priestly role, but especially if you could get elevated to bishop, you were all the money that was being given to the church, part of it went through your pockets. And so a family would gather money and then go to a bishop or a cardinal and buy an office for a member of their family so that they would be able to have the title. And then, of course, all the tithing that comes in, they get a part of it, they get to distribute it. And now the reformers are saying no. Rather, the congregation, each local congregation, must choose from among themselves officers according to the standards given by God and elect them and place them in that office. So these are your officers. They are not lords ruling over you. They are your officers 
whom you've observed and tested, seen their lives, and now you believe they are fit for this labor that needs to be done in the church. Therefore, everyone must take heed not to intrude himself by improper means, but is bound to wait till it shall please God to call him and be certain and assured that it is of the Lord. So no one can say, I deserve, I want this office, I will be given this office or bribed to get that office. Uh, the sin was, used to be called simony or simony, based on Simon who asked to receive the Holy Spirit for money from Peter. So this was the sin of simony of buying office. And we're saying absolutely that must never be allowed. And so no one can say, well, you know, I've been here long enough. Look at what all I've done. I should have this office. As I know, part of this call by God being confirmed is, does the rest of the congregation see it? Do the rest of the people say, yes, we will trust you to administer the things of God in the church. And if the congregation cannot say it, you're not fit for that office. Now, ultimately, if you are the right person, the Lord will move in the hearts of the people. But if you're not, be content that at least you still are part of the royal priesthood and the holy nation. If you recognize the value of being a layman, office is not so treasured anymore. Because you realize you're keeping all the dignity that you had as a layman. All you're doing is adding responsibility and accountability. It's not really a good thing to be an officer if you consider you have all the benefits of Christ and eternal life just as laity already. Officers get nothing more. Next, as for the ministers of God's word, they have equally the same power and authority wheresoever they are, as they are all ministers of Christ, and Christ is the only universal bishop and the only head of the church. Obviously, you can see here clearly this is against the papacy. We are saying that there isn't this gradation of, you know, the monks, or you know, first you start with the initiates, then you have the monks, then from them, some of them are selected as priests for local parishes, then you have the bishops over territories, then cardinals over the bishops, and then one cardinal chosen as pope who rules over all. And each one, of course, has, you know, lower and lower authorities you go along. We're saying no. Christ alone is head of the church. And every local congregation is a member of the universal church. And each minister of any congregation, small or large, young minister or old minister, is a minister of the word, serving under Jesus Christ, having equal authority with every other minister. That means, one, we should call always fit ministers. But the other is that we don't lord it over others. So you don't have this idea of, you know, we're the church here in downtown Los Angeles where we have 5,000 people. So when our minister speaks, you know, you lesser ones out there in the suburbs, you guys had better submit to our teaching. Rather, it is as our reform tradition with synods and the presbyteries do it. We gather together. Every minister gets the same vote. But there's something else. Every elder gets the same vote. So while a minister has to have extra training, in our case, three years of seminary, and then usually a year of internship, and then needs to go through a full examination. His vote is the same as each and every elder of the church, whether coming as you know garbage collectors, painters, whatever it may be, they get a same and equal vote with the ministers. Why? Because it's not about clerics versus laity. It's the chosen people of God ministering the gospel. And while some are called to this additional office and are worthy of honor, as it says, it's only insofar as they fulfill their role in the office, but they're not better and they get nothing special. And so this whole thing of equality among the ministers, but also when we meet in committee, votes equal to the elders, showing that it is the people recognized as the priesthood of believers who rule the church. Do you see that? So we are not... Well, pastor said it, we must do it. No, pastor hopefully is faithfully interpreting the word of God, but we won't know until the elders also certify that, yes, indeed, this was rightly exegeted and this is what must be done. And you, the people, are able to then speak to all the officers and say, please prove to me that this is legitimate because I too am a royal priest in this holy nation of God. And I also must be convinced of these things rather than having it imposed upon me. Next paragraph. Moreover, 
In order that this holy ordinance of God may not be violated or slighted, we say that everyone ought to esteem the ministers of God's word and the elders of the church very highly for their work's sake and be at peace with them without murmuring, strife, or contention as much as possible. We actually see this in Hebrews 13, 17, which I think we looked at previously. This idea of don't make it difficult and grievous for the officers to do their work. Why not? You're not saying that officers are flawless, sinless. You're not basically saying, well, they have power, I have to submit. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, rather, consider that they are ordinary men. They are here to serve with limited experience, limited knowledge, and with people who are stubborn and not the most cooperative. They cannot make a perfect church. There will not be a perfect church. And the reason for that is the ministers are flawed, the elders are flawed, and the people are flawed. So be patient and tolerant as we work together. So when someone says, well, you know, you guys aren't a real church. I know there's hypocrites there. Everybody doesn't do everything they're supposed to do. And the answer is, can you show me a single institution in the world that everybody does what they're supposed to do? Even in something as small and limited and deliberate as a marriage where husband and wife reject all others, have every opportunity to find someone else and not be married, but they choose to get married to one another. Do they have perfect harmony? How much more when we call to people from everywhere to gather together? So we need to learn to live together peaceably without murmuring strife or contention, not because we are servile and we glorify the officers, but because we understand this is an imperfect, unglorified world and we need to live together. But we do believe these men have been called and raised up to office and should be respected for that. And that means sometimes where we meet, when we meet, how many hours we meet, uh, who gets, you know, where do we uh, supply missions or whatever. It may not be exactly what you're convinced of. The question is, is it at least biblically sound? So perhaps you had a real heart for our church to plant in downtown LA. There's a lot of poor people there. There's a lot of needs there. But instead, we planted in Ventura. Do you then say, well, this isn't a true church because you did not focus where I said? Or do you say, well, the church is looking out to plant churches. And while this time it did not go where I prioritized, but we are doing the work. So you see the difference. On the one hand, my specific was rejected. I reject the church. The officers are all fools. Or the other is, it's not a perfect world decision needs to be made and at least this is a sound god honoring decision even if it's not exactly what i wanted that's what it means to live peaceably not to submit and say everything you guys did was right but to say at least what you did was within the word of god and i understand it's not perfect and can we in the future look towards doing whatever else it may be so article 31 then makes it very clear we do not accept that the pope is the head of the church as christ alone is the head of the church we do not believe that there's gradations of ministers that have greater and lesser power, but rather a minister of the word is a minister of the word answering to the Lord Jesus Christ with his consistory. And we believe elders and ministers have equal power and ministers therefore must be humble also. And the deacons of course have care for the material needs of the saints and they are no less than elders and ministers, but they have a very high honorable and necessary function. And lastly, you, the lay people, you are a, the largest part of the church. Of course you are worthy of honor, but according to your station. So don't intrude on the station of another because that adds responsibility. And if God hasn't called you to that, don't put that burden on yourself. So that's a number of the things that we see here. So the important thing that I want you to take away from this, yes, indeed, regardless of the office anyone serves in, you are indeed a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, the treasured possession of God. And you and I equally have a duty to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Even if your specific call is not to be minister of word and sacrament, you have neighbors, you have friends, you have family to whom you can proclaim these things. And as we saw earlier, that loving even our enemies testifies to the reality of the Spirit's work in us. And that's a burden that is already overwhelming to each and every one of us, let alone adding the additional responsibilities of office. It's nothing to be coveted ultimately.
Rather, let us be content with wherever the Lord has placed us and let us devote ourselves to the fullest abilities that we've been given to do this work and ultimately leave it to the Spirit of God for all things to be done well. Let's pray. Our God, we are thankful to you for the calling we have received and for your testimony and proclamation that we are a treasured possession. May this indeed be the great joy in our hearts so that we will not be jealous or envious of others, but instead be content in our role and calling as we've already received the greatest gift that we belong to you and we've been purchased by the blood of Christ Jesus. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you will grant to our congregation, but to all faithful churches, faithful men to be willing to serve in office and to love the sheep and to do good, seeing that spiritual and material needs are met and that all of us encourage one another to love and good works. So we thank you, Lord, that you have granted your church through all these trials for many ages to persevere. And we ask we will do our part for this short time that we are here on the earth. Amen. Well, then let us continue by singing Psalm 16, Preserve Me, O My God. And you see in there both a confidence that God uh, has granted messengers, officers that we should turn to, knowing that this means ultimately we will not be left in the grave but raised up. So let us stand and sing, Preserve Me, O My God. 